It was a night like which Terracon had not seen for many years. Long-forgotten constellations marbled the plum-purple sky with veins of lilac starlight. Seeing it inspired an illusory irritation to tickle his shoulders and spine, just as the grass had when, as a child in the summer, he would fall asleep shirtless in the meadows to a lullaby of nocturnal chirping. As much as those skies matched, however, the Borsan Desert could never be rendered as inviting as that child's dewy bed in the grass. Violent winds whipped a mile-long stream of sand against Terracon's armor. The grains chattered against the iron plating, echoed in his helmet, crackled in his ears. He winced until the wind subsided. The Salé's visor had spared his skin, but the sound still stung. The slipstream swept the sand into an undulating dunescape that spanned as far into the distance as the eye could see. Utterly indistinguishable and constantly in flux, the dunes offered no bearing for those who attempted to traverse the waste. There was only one possible route, a four-day trek across the narrowest panhandle. Any claim to have passed otherwise was a lie. Drift too far east, and the salty seas of the Twin Lake would lap away the desert. Deviate a few miles west, and the dunes would drift into a barren plain of desiccated rock. The only oasis was the great southern garden, raided by near an eon before. Tucked a thousand miles to the southwest, any attempt to arrive there from the panhandle was thwarted by the Forbidden Canyon, a massive gorge that cleaved the continent in two. The unfortunate few who found themselves at the canyon could not move forward and would not have enough provisions to turn back. Many perished having brought too little or because they collapsed beneath the weight of too much or perhaps because they had succumbed to redcaps, violent marauders rumored to haunt the dunes. In spite of all the perils, the route across the desert panhandle was determined to be the best option for rescuing Cassandra. By ship, the expedition to the northern peninsula would have taken at least two weeks. They would have to dock in the port of Tarasam, and then make a week-long journey through the gorges and passes of the eastern range. A dreadful fate for both the princess and kingdom were certain in that time. Had Cassandra ever seen a night sky as beautiful as this? Terracon lifted the visor of his salle to better stare at the sky. It was the only other place where the amethyst hue of Cassandra's eyes could be found. Maybe she had discovered this sky on one of her adventures. Hopefully she would see it again. The captain turned his attention toward a narrow archipelago of stars that scratched the zenith. Diadra's javelin was said to always strike true. So when she threw her spear toward the heavens, it never came back, but lodged itself instead as just another constellation in the sky. From this sky-bound spear, a trajectory for the shortest route across the desert could be determined. Terracon turned to look back over his shoulder at the plume of dust kicked up by the trotting unicorns. The sheen of moonlight on armor was all that discerned his fellow soldiers through the obscuring cloud. Terracon stood on the stirrups and pulled the reins. Ramses reared and neighed loudly to attract the squad's attention. Terracon waved and pointed to adjust their course across the shifting landscape. Mommy? Eyes snapped open into a darkness too pitched to extract a single detail. Waking into a night like this was common for Cassandra, but familiarity never seemed to quell the anxieties that lurked in the darkness. It was not that she was afraid of the dark. Rather, there were too many sights lost in the darkness and too many sounds muffled by sleep. Cassandra did not dare miss out on a single experience. She needed every one of them to satiate the monster of curiosity bellowing within her. It called in her nightmares. Her waking thought had been of walking along a splashing shore, of finding an empty conch and lifting it to her ear to hear the vacuum within. Instead, she heard its hungry pang. Mommy? Cassandra awoke acutely aware of that void. There was a vast chasm between her ambitions and her appreciations. Whole days had slipped over that edge without a single trace of admiration for anything accomplished or experienced. Cassandra could not bear the loss of all those sensations. It was not in the repertoire of a princess to genuflect, yet she had made a bad habit of descending to the darkness, of kneeling to reach, scratching and scavenging for some suggestion of contentment. She would rummage through the covers for some texture, but find she had only writhed out of bed, having almost felt it, but only almost. Hallways echoed the rhythmic clatter of her heels as she would run through the castle, searching the seams of the masonry for some secret passage. 
Mommy? Was that her own infantile shriek for safety echoing in the void? Nothing in the larder would satiate the hunger, despite every curry and cream having been spiced far beyond what most could stand. No perfume could overwhelm the seductive allure of curiosity. She longed to gasp in awe and wonder, but instead she choked in the all-consuming vacuum of aspirations. Every decision was haunted by the echo of a thousand unspoken alternatives, which she could see all playing out simultaneously, and despite their respective shortcomings, she still had to nominate one and acquiesce to the loss of all the others. Cassandra wondered if there was some crucial tidbit that had already been lost. She tried to remember, but noted only a tinge of guilt, as though she should have tasted something rather than eat it whole. Now there was no more, and she was so hungry. When had there been time to learn that lesson? There was a moment of wanting and a moment of having, but between them she could recall no opportunity. There was no way to escape, to search, and discover. Regardless of whether it was many successive moments or one long singular pause, she was waiting on a cold dungeon floor. She was being left in a moment of anticipation. She would have to settle with living in that moment, a void that would consume everything she was before she became something, anything else. Yet without the chance to become something else, there was a certainty about what she was. She did not have to fear herself, as she was restrained by the golden van braces. Her personal monsters were just as powerless as she was in these chains. These shackles truly were a ferocious talisman if they could placate a hungry heart. Marco had claimed they belonged to the demon Orkon. It had been many years since she had been through a history lesson. It was always one of her favorite topics, mostly because it was all stories, just like those that Terracon would read to her as she slowly drifted to sleep. The name Orkon was familiar, but placing it into context took time. Orkon was the patron of lost time, and reputed by several sources to be descended from black magic itself. The notion was unimpressive, as witches had long believed all demons to be the children of the Tawesh. Why, however, should these be his cuffs? Demons were slaves to the rhythm of black magic's breath. Their cuffs bore the sigils to keep their wills restrained, obsolete and replaced. There were no sigils on these vambraces, only bands of golden crescents, reminiscent of the coat of arms of the House of Hexen. How fitting, as she felt no more restrained by these chains than she did by her duty to her country and mother. Mommy? The whole of Cassandra's abdomen clenched. She clutched herself into a tight knot and drew her shackles defensively around her. Hello? Cassandra perked her pointed ears, turned the whole of her concentration to the silence, and waited for a response. Hello? Is someone there? The voice of another was enough to wash the loneliness from her, but it failed to bolster any sense of hope. She sympathized with the child. She wanted to be home by her mother also. There was no doubt in her mind that the restraint and confinement to this murky cellar was torment to the source of the voice, just as it was to her. Hello? There was no response. The air was still. The hint of warmth that whisked in with the molten morning sun served only to measure just how cold the desert night had become. Terracon had rolled himself into a tight ball beneath his heavy cloak, sheltering his face as best he could by tugging on the edges of his hood and ducking between his shoulders whenever a brisk wind kicked chilled sand into his eyes. As the day dawned, the Borsan Desert grew monotonous. The illustrious stars were fading into the ever-paling sky, and the earth just kept rolling from dune to dune, with no stone or shrub to break through the sand. Diadra's javelin had been lost to the horizon, but their course would not stray for long. Once the sun was up, it would be easier to navigate the tedious wasteland. Even the squad had grown quiet, too weary and sleep-deprived to partake in meaningless conversation. Terracon did not mind, as it gave him a chance to reflect on what was happening. The days were moving by so quickly, he felt as though he were losing his grasp on reality and unable to keep up with the pace. It had only been two days since Cassandra had last led them on a wild adventure. Unfair as it was, he wanted to blame her, daring that she knew no bounds. It was not her fault, though, and she could not be blamed for leading them through this desert. Terracon scoffed at the childhood hopes that he had entertained of one day crossing the desert, 
now realizing it would be nowhere near as interesting as imagined. You keep thinking one more dune, and it will be over, but it never is, said a familiar voice beside him. Eloise, are you still thinking in dunes? I'm already thinking in days, Terracon chuckled. Oh, you're just a pessimist. I swear I must be the only chipper captain left in the entire army, she said, rolling her eyes and popping some nuts into her mouth. She offered the bag to Terracon, but he declined. I'm surprised Karsak did not join us. He's always good for a laugh, Eloise continued. He's going to know something is up when both you and I are not at the captain's table today. Eh, uh, he will forget us the second he has assigned your company. He will do anything to prove himself, said Terracon. Ha, good riddance. Maybe he will have more luck with those immature fairies. They probably have a lot in common. You know, it is one thing to fight, but it is a whole other thing to lead. There is not a single solid swordsman among them. Not at all like this group. What did Draco do? There are people here I have never even met. It is like he took a sample from each of the orders. I'm not entirely sure what the chain of command is here. I will admit that it is rather awkward. I think with a group this small, it's pretty easy to assume that Prince Draco is commanding. Fine. But then who? Is there anybody here who is not an officer? Eloise asked. Terracon shrugged. The dark-haired woman in the front row. I think she's next. She is the major of the Order of Valish, really close to Draco. Then I think it is us. And the paladin, Eloise said, nodding demonstratively toward one of the finely garbed knights, his unicorn's black caparison ornamented with bright blue tassels. Terracon shrugged. Have you noticed who else is riding with us? That is the master swordsman, Remu, behind you. He is the best fencer in the kingdom. What about the humans? Eloise asked. I never would have expected Her Majesty to approve them. Shem has the best javelin pitch in the Empire. Draco wanted him. I requested that Daryl come along as he and I have hunted Cassandra for years. Eloise laughed. Hunted Cassandra for years? You make her sound like game. Yeah, basically. You would not believe the stuff that girl has put us through. Terracon rolled his eyes. What? And I'm just meandering through the vor sand for the fun of it? The white sun sparkled against each grain of golden sand that hissed beneath the unicorn's hooves. Although the cloak had been shed at some point in the sun's ascent, Terracon had soon found comfort beneath it once again. The air, like the desert, was dead, and though this kept the sand out of their eyes, it left them to be baked by an uninhibited sun. Chocolate ringlets foamed under the brim of the armored woman's barbute as she sprouted over the dune. The cream-colored unicorn charged over the swooping horizon, its muscular ankles clenched tightly as it surfaced a crumbling sheet of sand down the mound and into the shallow valley between the dunes. Lord Draco, she called out, turning the unicorn to block their path. Draco and Nesu slowed as they approached her. There are ruins in the distance, she said. How far off are they, Karen? Draco asked. It is just a speck on the horizon. The details are barely visible with the telescope. Draco and Nesu followed Karen to the sandy summit. Do you think they saw you? The prince asked as he kicked back over the saddle and dropped from his steed. They certainly had the chance to. I failed to discern it on my initial survey and only caught the ruin when I was checking our route. Hopefully they do not have a telescope thrown this way. Karen placed the tapering bronze tube into Draco's waiting hand. He laid between Karen and Nesu on the dune and put the telescope to his eye. Sand had collected in great swooping mounds against the yellow megaliths in the ruins' archaic walls. One corner of the keep peeked over the stone curtain, intermittently spaced with short, square towers. It was an architectural style riddled with faults, and one that had not been used in many millenniums supporting the myth that it had been built by a strange people who lived on the island before the witches, before it had become known as Escombreco. Draco handed the telescope to the vizier and asked, What do you think, Lord Nesu? It is still several hours from here. We could keep moving. Draco lay quietly contemplating for a moment before he spoke with a tone of exhaustion. No, I do not want to risk them seeing us. In this heat, and with this much sun, we are sure to be giving off a glare. Besides, we are going to have to break soon. I know I am certainly ready for some sleep. Let us fall back. We will make camp in this basin. No fires. The smoke will be too visible. We will start moving tonight. 
We will go slow so as not to raise a cloud. Draco stood up, grabbed the reins to his steed, and walked down the dune. Karen and Nesu followed behind him. The tents were set up to corral the unicorns together. Draco and Nesu kept the supplies with them in a tall tent, common to traveling lords and merchants wealthy enough to afford the spacious luxury. The others took shelter in more rudimentary accommodations. A waxed sheet, just large enough to lay beneath, draped over a suspended line. Many of the soldiers had already crawled into the shadowy recesses of their tents, easily succumbing to sleep. Those that remained awake had gathered outside the master's tent, finishing off what was left of the uncooked supper. Terracon sat opposite Nesu, staring at him, entranced by his attempt to fight the impending slumber. The vizier replied to any question that Draco had asked, but never turned toward the prince. Instead, Nesu just kept very still, with his eyes firmly shut, as though he were letting part of his body sleep without letting the whole succumb to it. Draco just kept rolling the pencil against his scalp, as though drilling some unclear knowledge into the utensil, so that when he would bring it to the map it might start scribbling some ingenious answer to the looming danger. Can we cut closer to the coast? Maybe take a beach route? It would take too long. We would never make it. What if we kept this distance and circumnavigated the fortress? We would lose a day, maybe more, and run dangerously low on supplies. It is not a risk I advise taking, Nesu said, still lost beneath his sealed eyes. What if we simply moved off the path a few degrees and then returned to our intended route once the castle is behind us? That would still use much time we do not have. As dangerous as the Vorsan castle is, I must wonder if perhaps our fears are unnecessarily elevated. If we move slowly across the Vorsan desert by night, then the armor will not shine. There will be no great plume exposing our position, and we should be safe to make our way. I do not understand why this ruin is so fearsome, said a skinny young man with delicate features and bright eyes. Castle Vorsan has seen terrible things in its time, and the screams of the dead that are said to still echo through its halls have supposedly attracted a dangerous inhabitant, redcaps. They bleed their victims for various cultural practices, namely dyeing their caps. The weariness was beginning to creep into Nesu's voice. In the history of sieges that the castle has endured, I do not believe any army has ever succeeded. I would like to just avoid the whole matter, but the castle is too strategically placed to make this journey without running the risk of crossing its occupants, Draco added. The youth just sat on the ground, blinking his wide eyes. Let us just settle this issue, Draco, the vizier began. We will head off course a few degrees and return as planned after we have passed the castle. We will lose some time, but it should spare us the trouble of those goblins. Very well. Draco hovered with worry for some time over the map, while Nesu and the others slowly drifted to their beds.